Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to guide you briefly through the Global Hunger Index. It's now the fourth year that IFPRI has done it. Uh, its academic scholarly concept was founded in the years 2000 to 2004, so I'm not dealing much with that. And you will all ask yourself, why is the head of communications talking about Global Hunger Index? Uh, there are several reasons behind it. Uh, one of it is that once the hunger index has been calculated, once it's done, it has turned out to be a tremendous tool to stimulate public awareness, public action with regard to hunger. That's one of the reasons behind it. Now, uh, there's an African proverb. Usman, correct me if it's wrong. <laughs> okay. You could, have, you could have said it's not from Senegal or something like that, but not, which says the hunger of one is the shame of all. And every year during World Hunger Day or World Food Day in October, uh, FAO used to do some sort of a bureaucratic entertainment with that, and uh, that was one of the reasons why a couple of years ago uh, the German... Um, non-governmental organization, Welthungerhilfe, or German AgroAction at that time, said we have to do more. It can't be that we just leave it with that. And they came to IFPRI and said, could we not do an index where we can at least calculate some of the key elements on hunger? And that was when the Global Hunger Index was invented, if you allow the expression, it is to raise awareness on, a regional country on, on regional and country differences on hunger. So awareness raising is, is one key element. To help to learn from successes and failures, which is another key element, and to provide incentives to act and improve international ranking. So what we aimed at is also that people would say, oh, we, we got a bad mark there and hopefully uh, country leaders would say, let's, let's improve that. I've seen that in, in the private sector before, where if uh, your company turned out to be a, a bad company with regard to environmental protection, then the CEO would do something. And that concept a bit in mind was also uh, the reason here. So it's not uh, geared mainly to academia although it's used very much in, in uh, school rooms and, and universities now. In Germany, two school books have, have started inserting the hunger map, so people start talking about hunger and the hunger index. The concept behind it is, yeah, also to stimulate a bit competition. You know, each of the uh, Washington doctors wants to be among the top doctors, and they do everything to, to improve their ranking, and that's also what, what we would like to stimulate among, among countries, and that's uh, one of the, the basic reasons behind the Global Hunger Index. Now, it measures, uh, the index itself measures three dimensions of hunger, undernourishment, child malnutrition, and child mortality. And they are basically in a statistically nice method put together and then divided by three, and then you get an index value. You will find more details on that in, in the report you have. And then you can rank. You will never reach the extremes. You will never reach zero. You will never reach 100. But uh, then the, the ranking was made that between zero and 10, it's low to moderate. Under five is basically what you would like to achieve and where most of the Western countries are. Uh, then serious is between 10 and 20, alarming between 20 and 30, and 30 to 40 is extremely alarming. So you would not like to be in that category. Now, how up-to-date is the data? That is one thing where also the Global Hunger Index has, has started discussion. Uh, you have to rely... Uh, I could jokingly say the only up-to-date data in the Global Hunger Index is the 1990 data because that's reliable and has been revised for 15 times, etc., and everybody has chewed on it. 
But the other data that found its way into the Global Hunger Index 2009, 2009 Global Hunger Index, is between 2003 and 2007. And the fact of doing the Global Hunger Index and the fact that there's such a big time lag has already uh, caused a lot of, of uh, uproar. Uh, people cannot understand that you can get your FedEx or UPS package and know two minutes later on your computer that it has arrived and who has signed for it, etc. And then it takes a couple of years until finally you have the data which are so vital. So uh, coming back to your measuring fever, it would be like saying Usman had uh, three years ago, he had very high fever in the afternoon. That's not good. But there's nothing better available. Nothing more reliable, nothing better currently available, but uh, I think also the discussion about the index has stimulated uh, a more, more push for more up-to-date uh, data, and we also had discussed with, with Welthungerhilfe whether one could do like, like boys, in, tsunami boys in the ocean, uh, measure whether on hot spots whether you, you, something is going on and perhaps also link better with fuels, etc. So that means that the food price rise of 2007-2008 is only partially reflected and that the global financial crisis uh, uh, starting in 2008 is basically not accounted for in, in this. We, we have some, some remarks on it in there, but uh, it, it also works under the assumption that who started bad in the year before uh, will not have been helped tremendously by, by these two crises. So the ranking by, by region, it's South Asia slightly the worst, and then Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, Near East and North Africa, and the best off on the top from the developing country areas, Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, South Asia, you see here with the regional values for the 2009 with 23.0 points, slightly higher than 2.21 for Africa. And you also see here in uh, this overview, regional overview, the huge reason of, uh, of the failure in, in Asia is the prevalence of underweight uh, in children. That's that, that big part there in the middle, which really is one of the unsolved problems in uh, South Asia. So if you look at the, what is called the Global Hunger Index map, and which is used widely, if you have 29 countries alarming or extremely alarming uh, levels of hunger, and uh, those with the extremely alarming levels country-wise are all in, in Africa. Uh, I will come at, at the end a little bit on the problem or the curse of averages, but uh, you see here that although um, Africa has these dark red countries, it also has green countries there, and that balances partly out for, for their rankings so that South Asia is still the worst. We have winners and losers. The, in the top list since 1990 to 2009, um, countries with the, uh, who, who made tremendous progress, and you see them from Vietnam to Kuwait, but you see also countries who even are worse off uh, these days than they had been in 1990, and uh, the top shammer there is uh, Congo Democra Democratic Republic, but also Burundi, Comoros, and a couple of other African countries. So in, in that map, which you also have in the, in the Global Hunger Index, you see uh, the decrease and increase in colors, and uh, you could imagine how the world would look like without China, because if China hadn't made these improvements, the hunger situation globally would look very horribly. Uh, we also tried to estimate what the implications of the global recessions could be, which countries was our question, are the most vulnerable uh, with regard to uh, 
the, the global recession, and we use the IMF criteria for assessing vulnerability with regard to trade, foreign investment, international aid, and remittances. And we then came to some sort of a matrix where we said there are countries, which you see here, from a low hunger index to extremely alarming hunger index, and then countries here who are highly vulnerable, and then going down to less vulnerable. And this right corner where you have Burundi and uh, Congo Democratic Republic, basically, they are already in deep, what's a decent American word for deep trouble, <laughs> uh, in, in here. And uh, yeah, the economic crisis will, will do its part uh, there for them. Uh, I was speaking about the curse of averages. Uh, the United States are, on average, a very non-hungry country. But uh, those who have read on Tuesday the, the uh, Washington Post know that there is also hunger in the United States. And uh, as a statistician friend of mine once said, if you have your right foot on ice and your left foot in boiling water, you have, on average, lukewarm feet. So we wanted to dig deeper and say what happened, basically, uh, or what happens in the countries is that just, uh, you know, we, we can't uh, believe that it's just the average that is distributed evenly across the country. So we started doing national hunger indices. The first one last year in India, we uh, developed with uh, nutrition from, from IFPRI and uh, UC Riverside and Welthungerhilfe, the uh, India State Hunger Index, and for the first time, basically. And you see that even in, in India, you have differences. You have like Kerala and um, Andhra Pradesh, and whereas here in that region, it, it, it's dark red. And um, I was there when, when we presented that in India, and I can't tell you the uproar that went through India from CNN, etc. It, it's the ideal country for uh, presenting research like that because it's, it's highly educated, it's agile, it has a vivid media. So we, we were, or they were in there with, with a report from CNN to everywhere. It led to requests in parliaments, etc. So that's Again, the reason why someone from communications is involved in, in, in all those activities, because it's, it really can change uh, the, the face of the earth. Uh, this year, we did the Ethiopia Subnational Hunger Index. It will go up on the web pretty soon. Uh, it was finished about a month ago. And then, um, as Oscar Wilde once said, that uh, imitation is the nicest form of flattery. Uh, we suddenly found in the internet, and someone sent it to us, the Nepal State Hunger Index. It was commissioned by the World Food Program, and they used the India State Hunger Index uh, um, um, methodology to do a state hunger index for Nepal. And I think nothing better can, can happen than if if the methodology is driven into the countries, that the countries start talking, you know, where, where are the hotspots within the countries? And on a global scale, uh, we, we keep on the flame burning. So that leads me to the final point. Each year, we combine the data of the Global Hunger Index. Originally, we thought it may not be enough if we present to, to the public uh, figures that have not dramatically changed from one year to another because they cannot actually dramatically change. So we thought we, we needed an added value to, to bring into that global hunger index. So we thought we would do a, a, a subject each year that has a strong relation to hunger and could then go deeper into that. Last year, it was the, f the food price crisis and its impact on hunger. This year, it is uh, the, the gender disparity uh, index. Next year, we already have also two topics, which I won't tell you yet. But uh, 
very, very hot topics, uh, very close to, to the subject, and uh, we were really glad that uh, we could have uh, Agnes and, and her team and others working on the um, why gender matters. And with that, I would like to hand over to Agnes. Thank you very much.